Another, it's a beautiful day today, and welcome back uh, to another program of the Monroe County History Club. Uh, I'd like to recognize my beautiful wife, Paulette. She's here again today, and also my baby of cousins, who will eventually be here, Bernie, Penny, and Nat. Well, there's Bernie and Nat. Uh, or Penny and Nat. B Bernie's late, I guess, as usual. So, uh, Many thanks to the American Legion, as usual, for allowing us to host these... Uh, great presentations they afford us the absolute perfect venue for what we do and thanks so much to the wait staff who do such a great job here please be generous with them uh, I'd also like to thank cats TV they've been doing these for six and a half years now uh, really made a difference in the programs once they started doing them we have uh, over 70 programs on YouTube from this and uh, maybe I'll live long enough we can get 100. Who knows? Uh, yeah, Catch TV, uh, it, it allows all these great local history lectures to be preserved for all those who follow us. Uh, any new attendees today? Anybody for the first time? All return. If, if you want to get on our regular mailing system, you can always leave your email address with me. We don't sell it to Kellogg's or anything like that. Uh, it's up to you if you want to get uh, regular announcements. I, I announce it on Facebook anyway, but a lot of people aren't on Facebook. Uh, right now, Daniel Schlegel, the director of the History Center, would like to make a few remarks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm back. I just wanted to give everyone a quick reminder that this week is the last week for our Cook exhibit, all about the restoration work Bill and Gail Cook did in Monroe County. So that exhibit, the last day it will be on display to the public, is on Saturday, July 2nd. And then starting uh, Tuesday the 5th is when that exhibit will start to come down. So if you have any interest in coming out to see that, um, Saturday is the last day for that. And what that's going to be replaced by um, and Michael's had a little bit of a preview of this, is uh, we have a Restaurants of Monroe County exhibit coming called Order Up. And so we have little flyers here because we do need some help. And if I'm not mistaken, this crowd knows history pretty well. So we thought this would be the perfect crowd to come talk to. We have been out to Ellettsville and Harrodsburg, and we're trying to get all the different communities involved, and including Bloomington. So I do have little flyers here. They're little quarter sheets, and they have some of the restaurants that we'd like to feature that we might have neat photos on, but we're always looking for artifacts to display. So maybe if you or someone you know might have some artifacts we could just have on loan for a short time. We'd love to put something like that on display. So after the presentation, I'll be where I normally am with uh, a number of the books, which the second slide is going to look a lot like this book I have. We brought almost all of Dr. Robison's books. So if you really like his presentation, which is excellent, come see me. I have a book, and you can read a lot more about it. And then the last announcement I have really quick is we actually have, um, we are planning something with the Civil War Roundtable. And we are doing a um, more about Lincoln. We're going to have some speakers. We have a bus trip we're trying to plan and coordinate. So hopefully we can pull that one off. So if you want more information about Abraham Lincoln and his impact, so we have uh, speakers from the Library of Congress that are coming out just for this event for us. So please make sure to stop by. I have a limited number of flyers, but I'm more than happy to have more run or direct you to our, our website. So. That is all I have, but if you have any questions, or we brought a lot of our basketball books today, so if you want to come see more of those, feel free to come over by and see me. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, Daniel. By the way, it's a good thing Daniel was here today. We had a little bit of problem getting our PowerPoint in place, and it took him about one minute to figure it out, so I'm glad he's here. Just a short rundown of what's coming up in the future. Uh, July 26th. Uh, Christine Friesel from the North County Public Library will give a program called On Kirkwood in 1967. There have been a lot of newly discovered programs uh, that have come up that she's going to talk about. Uh, August 30th, 2022, John Summerlot uh, gives a program called On Arbutus Mania. 
You might ask yourself, what is that? Well, that's what I asked him too. What does that mean? That swept uh, IU and Bloomington uh, in the early 1900s, spawning the yearbook name among many other things. So it's something I never knew about. Uh, September 27th, Brad Cook will return from IU Photo Archives. We'll show uh, some vintage photos of Bloomington, which he's done before. He's got a million of them. October 25th, Hillary Fleck of the Monroe County History Center. Uh, more photos. They have uh, the photo collection from the HT, which we scanned some of uh, from the 19, late 50s, early 60s. And uh, they've given her all their collection. And she's going to do highlights of uh, a lot of the photos they've scanned from about 1970. I'm not sure how far they're going to go, but at least 10 years probably. November 29th, Marge Faber will give a program on the history of local post offices. December 27th is open for right now. January 31st, 2023, Al Parker, a wildlife biologist, will give a program on the history of bald eagle reintroduction to Lake Monroe. Now that's different, so uh, that should be interesting. February 28th, which will mark our 10th anniversary, uh, James Krauss is going to give a program on the Indiana Theater at 100 years old. This is the 100th anniversary of the Indiana Theater which is now Buskirk Chumley. Uh, March 28th is open, April 25th open. May 30th, uh, this is the history of dry stack stone walls in Monroe County. You might ask yourself, what are those? But it, as you go around the county, I'm sure you've seen these stone walls, you know, uh, packed loosely with no cement or anything, all over the place. Some of them were from the Depression days and some of them for much older. So I found that kind of interesting too. And then tentatively on uh, let's see, May, let's see. Oh, on June 27th, about a year from now, James Capshew will do one on the life and times of Herman B. Wells. He had to postpone this. He had some things come up, so hopefully he can do it then. That brings us to today. Uh, we have here Dr. Roger Robeson. He's going to give a program called The Origins of Hoosier Hysteria, the IU Bloomington State Attorneys of 1911 to 1920. I've seen this. He gave it at the History Center, there, it was a bad weather day, and there were only a few people there, eight people or so, and I told him, I think we can get more than that here. And you turned out, you know, basketball should be able to do that in Indiana, right? So thanks for the good crowd today. So uh, Roger, I'll give it to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, as you know, I'm a substitute, there was a cancellation uh, those of you who were expecting to hear the lady from the Kinsey Institute discuss how to turn back the clock in the bedroom, I apologize. That, <laughs> that, uh, that talk has been postponed uh, rather indefinitely, she said, uh, more or less uh, until the Supreme Court is reconstituted. Um, we're going to talk about uh, bl basketball in Bloomington, and Bloomington has a... Uh, history in the state tournament, the last winner of single class basketball when our unique tournament ended in 1997 was Bloomington North. We currently have the uh, J.R. Holmes, the winningest coach in Indiana high school basketball. Few seem to realize that the tournament started here in Bloomington and, and was not uh, invented, originated by the IHSAA, but by the students at uh, Indiana University. And this is the basis of a book I did for, as a, for fun. And it takes in the first 10 tournaments, which nine of them were held here in Bloomington, and the other one was held at Purdue, but won by Bloomington. And this is all in a book, which you can get for the cost of publication, 10 bucks, and it's uh, all the proceeds go to the Monroe County History Society. Uh, the uh, originators were the Boosters Club of IU, the enablers were the fraternities and social clubs that housed these kids, seven-man teams, for, for three days, and entertained them, fed them. Uh, the avid supporter was the university president, Brian. And uh, little Bloomington was in the middle of nowhere. This is Appal beginning of Appalachia, 100 miles from the Mason-Dixon line. Smallest, poorest university in the Big Ten. And the controllers were the Board of Health, uh, the Board of Health, the IHSAA, which was uh, supposed to just be involved with eligibility because they didn't believe the tournament would ever mount anything. 
and uh, but they eventually uh, warmed to the idea. Uh, basketball was brand new uh, when it started here. You, you got to remember it was invented in 91, 92 school year, and the early teams were in New York City. They weren't in Indiana. The game spread on the East Coast. It was a YMCA game invented for YMCA patrons. Springfield, Mass., the East Coast, New York City was playing the competitive games uh, that first year. Uh, the second year, 92-93, uh, uh, YMCA's all over the country were playing intramural games. Uh, and uh, the third year, uh, there were actually competitive games in Indiana. And uh, the most famous one being uh, uh, Laf uh, Lafayette and Crawfordsville YMCA's. Bloomington didn't have a YMCA. They weren't playing. Uh, the first games so far have been found to be Terre Haute and Evansville. Very few box scores, but they were playing competitive games. Well, in 95, 96, uh, Purdue originated the Western Conference, now known as the Big Ten. And uh, this was because of football rules. Nobody was interested in basketball. Uh, football had been invented by the Ivy League, and uh, they dominated it, especially Yale and Walter Camp. And the uh, brutality was terrible. There were scores of young men killed each year. And in 1895, as well as 1905, they threatened to abolish the game. The Western Conference was originated to clean up football. The rules were terrible, and they included six years of eligibility. Walter Camp played football for six years at Yale. Amos Alonzo Stagg pitched baseball for six years at Yale. So the Western Conference started as a reform movement, and it started at Purdue. And they formed it with six other schools, Madison, Wisconsin, Minneapolis, uh, fairly good-sized cities, Champaign-Urbana. And uh, IU and uh, Iowa were the little sisters, the poor sisters. They were added about three years later. And Bloomington and Iowa City don't, don't rank with uh, big enrollments, big endowments and big cities. They were small towns, small potatoes. Basketball in the ninth year got a big boost when Yale came on a Western tour. Yale was, uh, they played a seven-man game in those days. A lot of the YMCA's were playing nine-man games. Yale uh, was considered the beast of the East, and they came west to play the best of the West, which was the Fond du Lac National Armory team. And they were going to play for the national championship, so Yale rented a couple Pullman cars, brought their own drinking water, and ventured uh, west during Christmas vacation and stopped off in Indianapolis to give the YMCA there a few lessons. Well, uh, the uh, preliminary game, uh, Short Ridge High School uh, defeated Butler in the preliminary to the big Yale team. And uh, this was the beginning of high school basketball in Indiana. Well, uh, by the 10th year of basketball, basketball was 10 years old when Indiana and Purdue started to play. Now, these are the results. Now, you see the first 10 years, Indiana won three games, and uh, Purdue won most of the games, and the students were upset about this. And you notice it didn't get much better after 1910. And to this day, it's not much better. The current <laughs> standings are Purdue 125, Indiana 90. Well, we shouldn't feel bad because Purdue has a winning record against every other team in the Big 14. And uh, they started playing early, and they had a YMCA, and these football schools were slow to adapt. But after those first 10 years, the students complained to the, they went to their uh, athletic director. And they had a boosters club, and some of these names might be familiar, might have relatives that were on this. These guys came up uh, with the problem and went to the AD and sought uh, a solution to Purdue winning all the games. Well, the IU uh, athletic director was this fellow. He was uh, from Wisconsin. And uh, he was a football man, but he'd been at Wisconsin for some time. And uh, Wisconsin has, was the first to start a high school tournament. And they had started six years earlier in 1905. And Wisconsin was a leader in all kinds of athletic endeavors. 
they were the first school to have uh, athletic directors and to train, you could actually major in physical education. When the IHSAA was formed in 1904, uh, their uh, uh, rules and regulations were copied directly from Wisconsin. So Wisconsin was the big leader. And uh, so the guy told them, the AD said, well, you might want to try a tournament that might attract some better players to Bloomington. And here was uh, where they played basketball in Bloomington. And this is a postcard. And on the back of the postcard is a player, Ernest. He's found out he was Zimmerman from uh, Morristown. And he was actually playing in the first tournament in 1911. Couldn't spell or anything, but he sent a letter back to tell teacher I was doing. This is what the basketball arena looked like. There was no seating on the ground floor, but you, you know, you had room up there, seated about 1,500, and this is where they played basketball. And this is the location. This is the old Crescent where they used to have classes. It's probably all administration now. But the assembly hall was over here, 5th Street ran along this way, and that's where the location of assembly hall was. Here it is today. It's a parking lot. <laughs> assembly hall was here. This is the union building. This is Kirkwood as it cuts through campus. This is Owen Hall. And this is all that marks the site of this famous location. And this was put here by the I-Men's Association a few years ago. There was a bigger, better one in the planning, but it's uh, sitting over there in uh, uh, Bradley's office uh, trying to get recognition, but this is all we have now. Uh, the first tournament then was held by the students. It was an invitational. It was not an open house. It was invitational only. And they decided on 12 teams. And what they did was they assigned uh, three or four students, uh, and they just divided it up into regions. The students selected a region. They said three or four students read all the newspapers from region one. And at the end of the season, the student says, well, the best team up here is Gary. And uh, here, are the, you know, the best team here is Rushville or whatever. And the students then read the local papers. These were not congressional districts. In 1912, the IHSA took over and used congressional districts. But the first was just a random selection by the students. And the first invitational was 12. Second invitational was 13. And housing. So where are you going to? Well, there were about eight fraternities on campus, and they housed these uh, kids. There weren't enough fraternities for 12 teams, so they had to have social clubs like the Delphinian and the Wrangler. And uh, in 1913 and 14, they had too many people show up here, so they had to put a lot of people in uh, uh, rooming houses and so forth. But the fraternities bore the brunt of uh, most of this. And uh, the fraternities uh, that were here were Kappa Sig, Phi, Phi, so forth and so on, Sigma Nu, uh, Sigma Chi, and, and so forth. Some of these are honoraries. Okay, this is the first team that won, and uh, this is their nice little turn, uh, trophy. And the trophy was uh, designed by the students, uh, paid for by uh, Indiana University, and awarded to uh, Evans, uh, Crawfordsville. And it just says basketball championship. Now, each of these first 10 trophies is different. And uh, this one, um, uh, was replaced in 1957, replaced by this thing, which states here IHSAA, because the first tournament was not approved, or the IHSAA had very little to do with it. And they weren't convinced that it would work at all. And so according to people from Crawfordsville, the IHSAA took this thing, and, I, and the Lord knows what happened to it. I haven't found it yet. It's supposedly over at Newcastle. But it was replaced by this thing with IHSAA on it. But they also got a nice uh, little uh, cup. And it says there, Indiana State High School, auspices of Indiana University. So each one of these trophies is different. And the IHSAA is vying for publicity with IU and IU uh, and the Boosters Club. But this one's got Indiana University's name on it. Now, how do you get here? Now, this is 1911, and uh, they didn't start numbering highways till 1926. Before that, uh, you had to go by uh, road, and the roads had names, the Lincoln Highway, 
the National Highway, the Dixie Highway, the Grand Army, the, you know, and you had color-coded banners on telephone poles to tell where in the hell you were going because there were no, so, and getting to Bloomington was darn near impossible. The glacier stopped at Martinsville, and uh, the cars weren't worth a darn, and there were no mechanics. So you were, the only way to get here basically was by train. Now, the Monon had 10 trains a day, five from the north and uh, five from the south. So there were 10 Monons a day into Bloomington. There were uh, four of these. Uh, uh, Indianapolis, uh, two, and from uh, Il uh, Effingham, Illinois, two. So there were four of the IC, and uh, there were 10 trains a day here. So this is how you got to Bloomington. Now, this thing is still in existence. And this was the mineral route, which was bought. Uh, IC is no longer with us, but the Indiana Railroad is. And this, this route... Uh, came down through Morgantown, Helmsburg, Treblack, Unionville, down to Bloomington. Uh, this is uh, Peterson Tunnel, a limestone tunnel up by Treblack. Look at the limestone there. And this is the Tulip Trestle, which is west of here over by Bloomfield. And this railroad's still in existence. And, of course, this is where it went, went through Bloomington. And it had uh, two uh, sets of tracks uh, up north here. Here's the College and Walnut. And, and, and then there's a section that went through town. And uh, here's this, this is still in existence here, uh, college and Walnut, Walnut and college, and, and here's this building still here. It's been apartments, it's been pizza place, tavern, but that's the old IC station. And um, here's the Monon. The Monon uh, is north-south. It was coming from Bedford going to Gosport. And uh, so the two lines, uh, as they came through town, came on Morton Street. And here's the uh, Monon line, is now the B Trail, and uh, Morton here, and there's still the old IC station is still here on Morton. And here it is. Uh, and uh, So that's how you got to Blooming. Next year they had another invitational, 13 teams. Uh, not a lot's changed. Uh, the basket's still 15... Uh, 10 feet up, uh, and uh, there were very few markings on the floor. Uh, now it looks more like a, a chessboard, but uh, these were early markings. The uh, free throws were 15 feet. They tried 20 feet once. Uh, one guy made one in the whole country, and so they went back to 15 feet. But uh, uh, until 1918, the basket was closed at the bottom. The ball had to stay in the basket to count. So it wasn't until 1918 that they cut a hole in the bottom and uh, made it uh, so, so the ball had, could go through. Um, 1912, the winning coach was Claude uh, Whitney. Uh, he was a Phi Beta Kappa from IU. Uh, later died in World War I uh, as a war hero. He was um, famous in Frankfurt because Lebanon beat him uh, 100 to 14, and uh, he was very famous there. Uh, here's the trophy that uh, they gave to Lebanon, which is uh, the first official uh, IHSAA uh, uh, tournament. And here it is the uh, Lebanon tournament uh, winner. About this time, uh, Purdue uh, is, has this beautiful gymnasium, uh, which is still there and still... Uh, in beautiful shape at Purdue, and a uh, nice big gym. And so uh, the uh, students at IU started hassling that they needed a better gym, like the one at Purdue. Meanwhile, the students finally uh, convinced the IHSAA, who now officially recognized the tournament, but all the expenses and money and everything, the students furnished everything, and IU furnished uh, housing for these people. But they decided to have an open house. They just, instead of an invitational, they just invite anybody that could get here. And they had 37 teams. Well, they were overwhelmed. They only had eight fraternities, and they had about another eight uh, social uh, clubs. And so they had to put these kids in rooming houses. They had to put them up for about three nights and feed them, take them to the movies and so forth. And they had to use three different gyms. 
Uh, and meanwhile, the Board of Control uh, sees a guy take over as permanent secretary. Now, what, what is the Board of Control? Well, well there's school teachers. The school teachers get together and elect these people, and they serve for a year or two, and then they're gone. They, they disappear, and so they're gone. But a secretary is a lot of work, and, and they want him to stay on to, to do the secretary. Like every organization, I'm sure you have one here, some poor lady that's been forced to be secretary for the last 50 years. But uh, they got a guy here, uh, Trester, who eventually took over because he's the only permanent member of this group. Everybody else is uh, elected, and there he is in his glory. Uh, these are the three gyms they used that uh, year. Here was Assembly Hall, which is now a parking lot, Student Union Building, and then there was a Mitchell Hall, which is uh, uh, just back uh, of Lindley. And here's what the Student Union, of course, uh, still there. I tried to find the gym and couldn't. It's well, I've taken over by office space. And uh, this is uh, Lindley. Uh, uh, back at Lindley was Mitchell, which was the women's gym. And it, it, uh, when I was in school, it was the Fine Arts Center. And it was finally, uh, this was finally torn down. Uh, here was the 1913 winners. And this is the front line. There's Homer Stonebreaker, the first big superstar. This is a guy named Blacker. And uh, you didn't get near the basket with those two guys. And uh, so these were the early winners. Uh, Wingates in Montgomery County, Crawfordsville, then uh, Lebanon in 12, and then uh, Wingate in 13 and 14. So this became a cradle, a triangle area of all the early winners. Now this is interesting because this is the Wingate Trophy, and it says Boosters Club on it. And finally, the Boosters Club, and it says Indiana University. It doesn't say anything about the IHSAA. And this, this is the uh, trophy, and this is a close-up of it. This trophy was rescued from the landfill. Uh, Wingate got consolidated, and like most consolidations, uh, they're now known as West Central Northeast. And the uh, principal and the superintendent says, well, we, we don't want no stinking Wingate trophies. Uh, we're North Central West East, you know. We're, we're pink and purple. We, we don't want any of this old stuff. So he had ordered the students to take it to the landfill, and they had two state championship trophies plus a 1920 gold-plated national trophy, and uh, one of the teachers rescued them from the uh, landfill, and they're now at uh, Newcastle Hall of Fame. And this now both says, that one of the few trophies that says, this is the Boosters Club, and this is IU that furnished this and furnished these trophies and paid for them. Well, also in 1913, you have these two guys. They were on the Boosters Club. They were both in SAE, Sigma Alpha Everyone. They were a good fraternity here. They weren't there at the same time because there wasn't room for them. But anyway, they were our famous alums. And uh, 1940, Wilkie ran for president. This guy would like to have run for president, but Roosevelt sent him to the Philippines to get rid of him. Roosevelt referred to Dear McNutt as that platinum-haired son of a bitch from Indiana. Well, they had another open house the next year, and even more people showed up. Four, 75 teams showed up. They had to have four floors. They had to have four gyms. Well, where were the gyms? Well, they used the first three that they'd had before, a union building, parking lot, uh, the student union building, uh, Mitchell, which is now gone. This is still here, but the floor is gone. And where was the fourth one? It's way over here uh, near where... Uh, uh, IU started Seminary Square, and this was a, a church building over there, and the church moved to where it is now, and uh, the armory bought it, and the second floor didn't have any pillars, so this, this was a gym that uh, you could play basketball on the second floor of this building, and that was the fourth gym. Well, then the, the IHSAA came up with this schedule. You can't blame the students. But uh, four floors, and this is the times, and uh, Wingate played uh, one game on Friday, and then starting Saturday, they're still at uh, floor B, Mitchell Hall. Then they go over here to D, which uh, most of the kids took a cab, but the Wingate couldn't afford it, so they ran. Then they're back to floor A, and then they finished up the tournament. So on Saturday, they played one, two, three, they played five games. You know, Iron Man. 
and, and here they are again. Here's Blacker, Stonebreaker, and Graves. This was the front court, and these guys were five iron men, men among boys. And uh, here are the all-stars from that year, home of Stonebreaker in the middle. And again, the Boosters Club trophy, which you can only see in Newcastle, but it's, uh, you know, gives uh, publicity to, for IU and, and to the Boosters Club, and beautiful, beautiful trophies which were rescued from the landfill. And these are the four early, uh, first early trophies. And the book has color pictures of all the trophies. Uh, uh, Stoney uh, later went on to Wabash, and uh, he and Bacon from uh, South Bend and Duvall from Lebanon, and this, this team was number two in the country by the Primo uh, Peretta Power Pole uh, computer rankings for 1917. They were ranked number two in the country. I think number one was Navy. And they were all underclassmen. So uh, this, this team was national championship caliber, except Stoney and Bacon got caught playing uh, profession, semi-professional football at, at Pine Village and got kicked out of Wabash. So that never happened. Uh, here's Homer and his glory. Uh, well, it was too many students, too many people showed up in Bloomington, 75 teams. Uh, the fraternity guys had to leave go, and go home. There was no room in the fraternity, and there was no room in the rooming houses. People were sleeping in bathtubs. So they, they decided to come up with a sectional. And they would have 15 sectionals because there were, there were 144 entries, double what it had been in the year previous year. So they cut it down by having 14 sectionals, and then only 14 teams showed up in Bloomington. And, and uh, the winner was Thorntown, and here was the triangle. The, uh, the first uh, eight uh, winners of the tournament all came from this triangle. Crawfordsville, Lebanon, Thorntown, this was, this was it. And um, this was the trophy. Now, Thorntown didn't know what happened to their trophy either. Uh, you had asked about it, and we looked for it for 10 years. And they said, well, uh, Jed had it in his uh, pharmacy window there, the, the drugstore there in Thorntown. And, and when he retired to Florida, we don't know what happened to it. Well, Lord knows, but it's ended up at Newcastle. So if you want to see the Thorntown trophy, you have to go to Newcastle. And uh, they made their own uh, little museum over there, and they have a nice little museum in Thorntown. And um, next year was Lafayette. Entries were now up to almost 200. Had to have 16 sectionals. And uh, one of the few times they used a cup. Uh, they awarded Crawfordsville a cup as a secondary trophy, but the Lafayette Cup for 16 uh, trophy is a cup. And uh, these are pictures of the cup. And now this extended the triangle. The first eight winners were all in this triangle. Meanwhile, here in Bloomington, we got the old gym here. Here's what became the Union Building. And uh, this was the old gym. And the students had been arguing for a new one. So this whole, uh, you know, IU had burned up in 1870 at Seminary Square. And so they, they bought Dunn's Woods. Or, uh, uh, and uh, there was an orchard here. Dunn's Orchard was up here. And uh, so the, this was IU was, had expanded into what was Dunn's Woods. And they decided to expand the athletic deal over here and put a new, the new gym across uh, 7th Street. But there was an orchard there, Dunn's Orchard, an apple orchard. So the answer to this was to uh, uh, give the students all a hatchet. So something like 500 students were given hatchets. And a few select ones were given uh, saws, and they were sent out to uh, uh, get rid of the orchards. And uh, here's uh, President Bryan with an ax ch chopping away at this. You know, this is a lawyer's dream, right? I mean, it's a wonder they didn't kill each other. And uh, they cut, cut down the poor orchard so they could build this wonderful building. Well, at the same time, they, they have a guy graduating at 16 called Cliff Wells, and his dad ran a restaurant here, Wells' Cafe. And Wells is uh, on the, on the uh, basketball team in 1916. Here he is. And uh, these are names known in Bloomington. And this was the coach, Montgomery. Uh, and uh, so this is the 1916 Bloomington uh, uh, team. And they won the sectional. Well, 17 Lebanon won. And 
this is a new gym now. They're playing in a new place. And uh, they had 20 sectionals. So 20 teams came here. And this is the Lebanon Trophy. Again, each one's a little different. But this one, see, there's no mention of IU. There's no mention of the Boosters Club, is there? <laughs> no, it's IHSAA. So they're uh, raising their ugly head. And this is the new gym, second floor. And you, 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 the only way you know what it's east and west are these funny windows. They, they face uh, uh, north and south. And um, here's the original gym on the second floor. And uh, you can see from the windows that, uh, you know, it, it ran east and west, or north and south. Could, and, and these are the markings that see, there's not much there in, at this era. And uh, it's what it looks like today. And uh, we had these wonderful things in the hallway. And these were old Indian symbols. And the university just spent millions tearing them all down when they could have just removed these. They just decided to get rid of the whole thing. So this is the building as it looked. And it was used as the main gym for IU from 17 to 28. And it had uh, glass backboards. Backboards were originally invented to keep spectators from batting the ball away. <laughs> But uh, we had a place here in town that made glass backboards. So they opened us up with glass backboards. And uh, they played Iowa in the first game. And it's the lowest game, uh, I think Bob was, it's the lowest game in, in, in Big Ten history because neither team was used to the glass backboards. So we beat Iowa 12 to 7 in the, one of the <laughs> lowest. Uh, but the worst thing was that they were so excited about opening the gym that they forgot to hire a referee. And they had to, had to ask uh, for volunteers and, and who, who signed up, but Piggy Lambert from Purdue signed up to the coach at Purdue, refereed the game. Anyway, when they built this thing, they, they wanted a better gym, and, but they couldn't afford it. So the architects figured they might have a little trouble figuring out where to put it. So the architect left marks on here how to, how to do it. And eventually then they built this thing in 28. And um, here it is uh, from above. That's the 1917 gym on the second floor. There's the funny windows. And this was the field house that many of us remember. All right, 17 champs. These, these were uh, the uh, state champs. Great coaches, famous coaches at, at, at Lebanon. Uh, Lambert was the coach, later went on to Purdue. Uh, Skaggs won in 17, and uh, Glenn Curtis from Martinsville won in 18. Uh, meanwhile, in, in, in 17, um, Wells, uh, Cliff Wells, is a freshman at IU, and the coach uh, leaves at midterm, at, at, at Christmas vacation. Coach Montgomery left and took a job at Purdue, and Wells' uh, younger brother, who had the biggest ears in Bloomington, uh, uh, is on the team, and, and they asked him to step in as an interim. He's, he's a freshman at IU, uh, and he had helped Montgomery coached the team when he was a senior. He'd coached the freshmen, including his brother. Here's Rogers, May, Mark. These are all famous Bloomington names. And uh, so he, uh, he agrees. He finished the semester, and then it, it took him another nine years, but he finally got his degree. But he, uh, he stepped down and, and it filled in, and he won the sectional and did well, so they hired him. Well, meanwhile, the war starts, and... Uh, Lebanon repeats, uh, and now they're averaging about 15 teams a sectional. There's 300 teams in this tournament. Uh, again, uh, uh, a majority, but not uh, all of the teams. Eventually, they hit around 800, and around 90% of the, uh, some of the teams in the state would play. But uh, they were averaging quite a few, and uh, Lebanon repeated. And uh, this was uh, one of the first pictures taken. And this is the IU gym up there on the second floor. And this is what it looked like, seated about 2,500 at most. And um, there's the Lebanon thing. Nothing about the Boosters Club, nothing about IU. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, this is the 1918. This is uh, the local team. Wells is coaching it. He's dropped out of IU. He's going to IU part-time. And he has most of these guys back. This guy graduated. Uh, short. Uh, uh, looks tall here, but only 
uh, Wells' dear brother, uh, he became the center. Uh, he would be the center the next year. He was the shortest man on the team. Never got a tip off, they say. Uh, and uh, so these guys all were coming back. Uh, 1919, uh, well, the flu was 1918. So the teachers didn't show up much for the teachers' convention. So when it came time to vote on where to have the tournament, which had always been in Bloomington, uh, they didn't have enough, so the, the, the Board of Control had to decide. And they were under intense pressure to, to let Purdue have it. At this time, they, they, they also competed for a state track meet. And state track meets were held in Earlham or Franklin. And then there were state baseball meets. And so anyway, uh, because of the flu, the vote was uh, reduced in size. And the Board of Control said, well, we'll have it at, at, um, at Purdue. And uh, they, in the, the, the concept of a Final Four was unknown. And the, the, the buys, they had a different numbers of teams, 20, 22. Uh, nobody ever thought about 16 as a magic number. And so you had to give buys, and the buys were given at the end. So you ended up with having a final three or a final five. And, and when you got there, you were given the buys at the end rather than at the beginning. And so when the tournament was held in Lafayette, uh, Lafayette got a buy. They were in the final three and got a buy. So Bloomington beat them anyway. But Bloomington won the tournament. Well, it was the time of the uh, flu. And unlike, uh, and here, this is the old uh, uh, gym full of sick people, soldiers. And um, uh, unlike COVID, the flu in 18 was left up to the county health guy. So each county was different. And Bloomington's was tough because of Indiana University was tough. And Indiana University suffered very few fatalities because they had a tough policy. And, uh, but they went, and, and Monroe County, went, they weren't going to play any basketball. They weren't allowed to. So uh, Cliff Wells scheduled Bloomington High School. His first nine or ten games were all away. He, he went and played up in Anderson or Muncie where the uh, flu wasn't very bad. So he got tremendous experience with away games. And when he did come back to Bloomington, he scheduled uh, double headers with IU so he could use the glass backboards because the tournament's going to be at Purdue, who also has glass backboards. So he, he, uh, he playing away games, and he's playing a lot of double headers at, at the IU uh, auditorium. Well, the, finally the flu ended, and they were able to get back to normal, and the locals won the state tournament, defeating Lafayette in the final, even though Lafayette had had a bye in the, in the final four. And this was the team that won it, and uh, Wells had joined the Navy in, in uh, 18 uh, after the season, and they sent him to Great Lakes, which makes sense. There's water up there, and you're in the Navy. And somehow he got finagled uh, uh, being sent to Bloomington where there is no water. And he was evidently uh, recruiting. And, well, the war ended in November, but uh, they were a little slow discharging these guys. And practice starts, you know, in October. And uh, so he's uh, obviously his pictures are all taken of him in his sailor suit because he didn't get discharged till about Christmas. So he's the only state champ uh, in his sailor suit or in his military suit. And he's also the youngest state champ, youngest, youngest guy coached to ever win the tournament. And uh, here's Short, the, and it was said at the state tournament, uh, well, the whole team averaged 5'7", I think, or something like that. But, and uh, Short never got a tip off at the finals. But they could shoot well, and they did other things well, and um, won the championship. And here's uh, uh, Cliff Wells. Uh, the tournament, the Bloomington Trophy, which is buried there in Bloomington High School. And uh, 1920, the Franklin won the tournament, but they weren't the best team. The two best teams were at uh, Crawfordsville and Wingate, both in the same county, both in the same sectional. And um, 
the triangle uh, uh, had been broken by uh, Bloomington. And uh, Wingate had an exceptionally good team led by Lon Goldsberry. The coach was Blacker, the same guy that had played for uh, Wingate in 13 and 14, played with Homer Stonebreaker. And this is uh, a player that uh, he had. Now, he's got the same last name, and you, you got to figure the DNA in Wingate can't be that different, you know? I mean, it's about 50 people live there, but allegedly this guy was no uh, relation. But uh, he ends up uh, in 19, he was coaching Wingate. He ended up at Crawfordsville. And uh, he had some pretty husky boys there. And by 1920, uh, he's, uh, he's got a pretty good team. And here's Blacker. Now he's coaching Crawfordsville. And he's brought this non-relative, who's also named Blacker, along with him. And these, these guys are uh, awfully good. Meanwhile, um, Wingate's awfully good. And Wingate's now coached by something else, but they've still got uh, Goldsberry, Crane, pretty good team. And they both accuse each other of uh, illegally recruiting players. And so uh, Truster kicks them both out of the tournament before the season began. And this is what made him famous. And he, he became, uh, he was one of the few state commissioners that actually wielded some power. The rules are clear, the penalty's severe. You know, he was, he was famous, and he got in the Naismith Hall of Fame. Anyway, you can't read this, but it's in the book. But uh, Wingate had a uh, tremendous schedule. This is the Tri-State Tournament in Cincinnati, Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana. And uh, it, it, came down to, uh, uh, it came down to Crawfordsville, uh, beat Wingate in overtime. And, and Crawfordsville won the Tri-State and, and had a season like, you know, 23 and one or something, you know, had a fantastic season. And uh, meanwhile, um, they have a tournament up in Chicago run by A.A. Stagg University of Chicago as a recruiting. They invited all the national uh, state champions of all the various states. And eventually by, in the 1920s, this grew to 30, 40, uh, schools but competing for a national championship. It wasn't that big in 1920, but Crawfordsville, uh, which had won the Tri-State, lost to uh, uh, Wingate, and Wingate won this and got this gold-plated trophy. Uh, this also was rescued from the landfill. Um, Jake Gimbel, just a few words. He started giving out an award. Kid from Bloomington won it in 1918. Ralph, how do we pronounce it? Is Isri. Isri. And, um, uh, the, the Gimbel department store, some of you have heard of, it no longer exists, but I guess some of you have heard of Gimbel's, and there were seven brothers, uh, and uh, they were a, a Jewish family from Bavaria, and he came up from New Orleans with a push cart and opened his first store in Vincennes, Indiana, and later on expanded uh, around Philadelphia and then New York, they took over Saks, uh, Fifth Avenue and took, they were a really big department store, used to compete with um, uh, the other Macy's, Macy's and Gimbel's and the parade and all that. And, and, and Gimbel's was, was big and their claim to fame is they invented the Slinky. I mean, yeah. but these were the seven brothers and, and uh, we had a, this original Gimbel's though was, was um, in, in Vincennes and it just recently burned and uh, it had been there since 1857. And uh, Jake Gimbel was a cousin. He was not in the direct line, but his dad was, uh, was a, um, a cousin, a brother of the original family. And he started giving awards out in 1917 uh, uh, to IU and other universities. He moved to, when his mother died, he finally moved to California. He was at UCLA in 1930. And they're still giving Gimbel awards. Uh, West Coast, Stanford, UCLA, uh, they're still, uh, NIU still has a Gimbel Award. And uh, this is, uh, he put up a, they wanted a victory pole out there at UCLA, and he paid for this. And he wanted a fountain, but they wanted the money for this, so he, Jake Gimbel gave him the money. And at the bottom here, he, he, he put a fish in here. He, he, he had uh, financed uh, some uh, students from people, uh, 
David Starr Jordan connection with some students who here at IU wanted to go down to Brazil and study crazy fishes, and, and so they named a species after him. And IU gave him an honorary degree, didn't give him a doctorate, but gave him a, a master's degree. And I uh, never married, uh, lifelong bachelor. Might have had a few little problems in the closet, you don't know, but when he died, he left money for sex lectures. And uh, every year he'd have a big, and, and Kinsey gave one of the first ones. And this guy was Eric Byrne, was uh, one who, uh, uh, famous uh, back 50 years ago. And so all these sex lectures were funded by him. But he is the originator of, of the Sportsman's Award, the Gimbel Award. And um, the, you, in closing, we say the, about this about the YMCA. They invented basketball. And uh, in World War I, the Red Cross was famous for passing out donuts. And the YMCA, not to be outdone, passed out cigarettes. And they strapped the cigarettes to these small dogs and sent them through the trenches. There's the YMCA logo. And so the YMCA, we have to thank for these many things. That's it. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Yeah, 36 and 37. They, they, uh, they experimented with it out on the West Coast for a couple of years. The, the Pacific Coast Conference, the original Pac-12, they experimented for a couple of years with it. And it seemed to work. So uh, they started out in 36. There was no free throw after there was no, yeah, uh, there was no jump ball after uh, a free throw, made free throw. And uh, nobody died. They would have thought, oh, this pace will be too much. The kids will drop dead. So in 36, you had no, free, uh, no jump ball after the free throw. There had been jump ball after every score. So in 36, they eliminated the um, uh, jump ball after a free throw. And that worked out so well Then in 37, uh, they said, OK, there'll be no jump ball after the field goal. Uh, you just, you know, change sides. And that worked so well that uh, the game took on a new appearance, and it was much faster. And so that led to the NIT in 38. Uh, the, the, the promoters at the, at the garden <laughs> said, hey, we can sell this game. So they, they had an invitational of eight teams, four local New York teams, and four out of state that were considered the best. And so the NIT was the big tournament for the first 10 years. And then the NCAA came along the second year, 39, after, after the center jump had been eliminated, and, and said, well, we can't let the NIT hog this. Uh, we're going to have a tournament of college champions by sections and make it national, whereas the NIT was focused in New York. But uh, as many of you know, the, the NIT was the tournament. Uh, the, the most famous story is 1943. Uh, uh, during the war, the um, uh, Utah, of course, the only people playing ball in 43 were four Fs. You, you know, if you were crippled or had rheumatic fever or were 18 years old, you were, you know, everybody else was drafted. Well, Utah won something, you know, the Big Sky or the Mountain West or something. And the, uh, the NCAA offered, offered them a bid, and they said, no, we don't, who, who wants to go to the NCAA? There's no, no money there, no friend. And the NIT uh, invited them, and they were thrilled, and they went to New York City, and they didn't get unpacked before Kentucky flopped them. And, and uh, they were right back on the train, headed back to Utah. Well, in the meantime, uh, Arkansas, which was playing in the NCAA, had a car wreck. And they had a couple guys severely injured, and they couldn't play. So the NCAA uh, telegraphed them on the train, and asked Utah if, if they would consider on their way home stopping off in Kansas and, and playing in the NCAA. And so they had nothing to lose, so they, they went to Kansas and won. Well, during the war, they had the Red Cross Classic. The NIT winner played the NCAA winner. 
So they uh, had won the NCAA, so they went back to New York and finally got a chance to see some of the, you know, see the Empire State Building. You know, they got a chance to unpack, and lo and behold, they beat the NIT winner. <laughs> Ended up uh, as, as champion of both. But the, the NCAA, Purdue turned it down in 40 because it had lost money in 39. And it, it, was, it was enough, it was considered flaky. And that's why Piggy, one of the reasons Piggy Lambert turned it down. Uh, and so IU went in 40 as the second place team in the Big Ten. And uh, in 42, uh, when the Sage of Salem, uh, Everett Dean, won it at Stanford, he got back home uh, on, by the train, and, and there was a, a whole 10 people waiting for him at the station when they got back after him. So anyway, times change. Yes, sir. Yes, the but, D. Uh, what was the rule about some players had to stay on one side of the uh, court? They couldn't go all, all That the was side. girls' basketball. Yeah, was girls. Oh, uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. But the defenses were brutal in the early days. The, the uh, rules uh, favored the defense. Uh, the defense was very rough and, and, and hard. That's how it made his name. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, girls. Girls basketball started when a woman from Tulane uh, uh, decided that your womb could fall out if you were running up and down the court, uh, which makes sense, you know. I mean, uh, uh, so she came up with this girls basketball, which uh, I don't know if we got anybody from Iowa here, but somehow it took off in Iowa. It was it, uh, girls basketball in Iowa was as big as boys basketball is here. And that was, you, you were in the third of the court, you were offensively and then, uh, or defensively, and you got the rebound, you passed it to the middle court, and then they passed it to the offense, yeah. But uh, somehow in Iowa, we got anybody from Iowa here? Uh, but, uh, you know, that was their game. Yes, sir. Yes, until 23, uh, one guy shot the free throws. And the only time, if he, if he fouled out or was subbed, and, and substitution was difficult in those days. Early on, if you subbed a guy, you couldn't bring him back. Uh, uh, so in the, in the early games, uh, there wasn't a lot of subbing uh, done because you couldn't bring the guy back. And there were guys that got caught short. Uh, Bloomington in 1919 or 18, one of you, I forget which, got caught short. Uh, they were way ahead and, and uh, subbed. Uh, and then the other team caught up, and, and they couldn't bring their starters back. So uh, the, the rules changed uh, on subbing. But one guy shot all the free throws, and as a consequence, he was usually the high point man. Yes, Bob? <laughs> well, anyway, I went to, uh, years ago, um, was, uh, went to Bloomington High School, yeah, South was South, and um, to get the 1919 yearbook and, and pictures of the team, and uh, they didn't have the yearbook, and uh, I said, "Well, how could you not have the yearbook? You won the state championship." And this was before J.R. Holmes started winning championships at, at South. I said, "You know, this is a, you know your only championship, and you're telling you know, what." What kind of idiots would lose the book? I mean, it's been stolen, or don't you have extra copies? I said, well, let me talk to the principal here. I, this is, this is malfeasance, you know. I mean, and I went in and talked to the principal. I said, how could you, small town hick, you lose your yearbook with pictures of the, of the team for God's sakes? I mean, what, what kind of idiots are you, you know? And, he fumbled around and went, I don't know, you know, I said, Jesus Christ. I said, you know, what kind of buffoons are running this place? And then I, a couple of days later, I went over to Columbus uh, to look up uh, Chuck Taylor, the shoe guru. Uh, he graduated in 1919. And they didn't have a yearbook either. And I said, well, what? And I said, well, idiot. I said, don't you know that was the 1918 flu? Uh, the fall of 1918 is when the yearbook people work, and because of the flu, uh, a lot of schools didn't have yearbooks. And I said, oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. 
I didn't have the guts to go back to the Bloomington and apologize to people. Yeah, so the pictures were in the next year, 1920. The pros, yeah, the pros, te the pros te teams tended, they, I think they started, I think some other. Well, uh, to keep the ball from going out of bounds, it was more continuous action. You know, if you're selling tickets, if it's a professional thing, they, they wanted to, they were the originators of the, the cage, kept the ball from going off the court. And, and but there were mad scrambles for it too. The rules, you, the rules now are the, the last guy that touches it loses it. But the original rule was the last guy that touches it, it was his ball. Uh, and so, they, so there were these mad scrambles for loose balls, and so they they had made cages, and and the Indianapolis YMCA played uh, played somewhere. It may have been Fond du Lac or somewhere where they had a cage, and I guess they just about killed themselves up there uh, trying to play in a cage when you weren't used to it. Yes, sir. Well, yes, the, uh, the, the current, like, um, uh, my high school, Frankfurt, uh, uh, the 29 team had three married guys. Uh, the, uh, the rule against marriage didn't come in until the 37 or something. And the, the age, age rules differed. Uh, originally, a farm people might go half year or people work on the railroad half a year and then go to school half a year. So there, there, there were not the age limits. I, I forget when the, uh, yeah, they, you know, originally it was 21 and then 20 and, and uh, it was a famous team during the war that only some of us old timers remember. Uh, long Tom Schwartz, who was a freshman on the 45 IU football team but one of those Kokomo teams uh, during the war uh, had a guy that uh, became ineligible uh, after the semifinals. <laughs> he he got, took Kokomo clear through the semifinals, and then he couldn't play in the finals because he turned 20 or 21. But yeah, the, the age, age varied quite a bit. No, no, I see. That was only till 37. Until 1937, yeah. My high school team in 1929, three of the starters were married. But after that, after 37, you couldn't be married. Really? Yeah. I remember I was a senior in high school back in Illinois. Tom and Dan Blumacher, who were a district team that went to the state tournament. Uh huh. They had a guy who was married. Huh? But what? Yeah. State Illinois. Yeah. After yeah. 67, yeah. Oh, well, that's yeah. <laughs> Well, that was another of my embarrassing moments. Uh, the, uh, they had a big brouhaha here in town. This was back in the 70s. And we used to have all-star football games. Uh, Dickens, Phil Dickens, I think it was called. The Dickens All-Star Game or something. They had high school all-star game. And it was in the summer. And uh, Guy and I went one you know, July afternoon or August and uh, had a few beers, too many. And we were sitting in the last row of the IU Stadium, and um, the IHSAA commissioner was being awarded something or recognized at halftime. And uh, he was uh, involved in this brouhaha. Some local kid had gotten married and couldn't play, and so there was a lot of controversy, you know. And people wanted that rule changed, and I felt strongly about it, you know. And, the IHSA said, no, if you're married, you know, dirty talk in the locker room, you know, what's, what's, what's dirtier than being married, you know, I mean, all those vile things you'll say, you know. So I was incensed by all this, and at halftime, they, they had the commissioner, the IHSA commissioner, who I identified with the other side, awarded something and on the 50-yard line, and I was sitting, you know, 100 rows back. So they announced him, and I screamed every obscenity I knew. You know, hey, you know, rotten, mother, God, God, son, son of a God, God. And I just gave him hell, you know, I was 100 rows back. I figured, who, you know, who's going to hear me? 
Well, he got his award, and the old boy started walking up the stairs. He's a white-haired guy. I thought, Jesus, the old boy heard me, you know. He's come up here to clean my clock, you know. I, God, what am I going to do, you know? I said, well, I, you know, how, how could I hit him? And he goes backwards. I could, hell, he could die. He could hit his head. I, if I don't defend myself, they'll think I'm a coward. What am I going to do? And, and he got about three rows from where I was, and I was trembling. I didn't know what I was going to do. And he sat down with his family, his whole family. <laughs> and I, I, I got down on my hands and knees and crawled. And I've never said anything in a game since. No matter what happens, I, I'm sorry. I never say anything. Would that still ask you? I think so. <laughs> I was so embarrassed that I crawled out in the hands and knees. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you. Oh, buy some books. Buy some books. Buy some books.